Um, so I'm an SEO and I'm here today to basically say sorry. And what I'm sorry for is this. And this is, I'm not sorry for this specifically, this is Argos's bad. But we've all seen cases like this across the web where it's just content and it's content that's sort of shoved at the bottom of a website. It's not really there for users. Um, in actual fact, this is blown up. Like the font on the Argos's website is very, very small. It's not there for users. It doesn't add any value. The whole reason it's there is basically for SEO. And you can actually see that in the code. Like it's actually the kind of box that that's in, in the code is called the SEO box. Which, yeah, never do that, by the way. That's <laughs> kind of like, dear Google, please don't penalize me. Um, but yeah, uh, countless websites have this stuff just sort of shoved at the bottom of the website. I want us to give a kind of a different definition of content, because I think that is a very outdated view of how the web works. And also, it doesn't serve the purpose that it's being put there for. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how search engines and other aggregators view content, hopefully to explain why we shouldn't be doing that as content kind of experts anymore. This is a really good quote, and I've completely forgotten where I heard it, uh, which is terrible because I should be citing who I heard it from. But it really, I think, crystallized what I think I do in kind of my living. So it says, if I search for pizza, I'm not looking for quality content about pizza. I'm looking for lunch. And I think very often, as um, kind of people who develop assets and content for the web, we forget the user intent. We forget what is this user actually looking to deliver when they're on this page. And instead, we just cram in words because we think that's what Google wants. Uh, typical example, a um, bit more trying to travel later. If somebody's searching cheap holidays Spain, what is the best content for that user? Is it this? Is it a kind of list of prices and the cheapest one being surfaced? I think so. I think that £100 figure is probably the best experience for that user. What it isn't is this. It's just kind of lots and lots of keyword rich gump that's maybe kind of seven, eight hundred words just kind of shoved in the page. That is not what that user is looking for. They are telling you they want to compete, they want to get a good price on that holiday. I'm an SEO, so I'm going to talk a lot about Google. I kind of very much see the internet through that prism. Um, I'd argue, though, that Google is just like any other aggregator. Um, if you go on to Reddit, Reddit are doing, letting you opt into a community, and then they're using community signals to try and surface the content that they think a user wants. A Twitter or a Facebook, they're about kind of leveraging your network effects and figuring out, OK, what, who in your social group are engaging with, and we'll figure out what you want to engage with off of that social graph. Um, very different approaches, but ultimately the same problem. We want to surface the content that we think a user wants. That's the fundamental point of any sort of aggregator on the internet. Um, so what I'm going to like I say, I'm going to talk mainly about Google in this deck, but I think it's equally true regardless of channel. So hands up, who uses Chrome? Right. Keep your hands up if you've ever turned these switches off. So every single thing you do as a user is being dialed back to Google servers. Uh, it has to be, because if you've got like a prediction service to load pages more quickly, it has to be able to anticipate what, user, what you're likely to click on so it can preload the next page and kind of start downloading that in the background. That's how these systems work. So every single mouse move, every single touch, everything is being boomed back to search engine servers. And they're using that data, and they're using that to feed back into their algorithms. Um, there's a um, writer, Ben Thompson, who makes a good point that if Google has, you have the exact same algorithm, if Google has 50.1% of the market and Bing has 49% of the market, um, Bing's going to lose because they don't get as much data feeding back into them. So over time, that just becomes this unmanageable, un kind of beatable gulf between the two algorithms. Um, if anybody's never, if you've, this is a document I think that's well worth everybody reading. Um, this is the Google Search Raters Guidelines. So Google has a team of several thousand people, and they're, they're intentionally not employing people who are, who are kind of know the ins and outs of the internet or understand the inner mechanics. These are just kind of, it's, it's like a kind of £10 an hour kind of gig economy type job. And what they're doing is they're just getting people who don't really understand kind of how the web works, they just use it day in, day out to go on pages and just rate them and say, do I trust this? Is this a trustworthy site? Yes or no? Would I engage with this? They then take all that data and put it into a machine learning algorithm so that they can say, OK, what are the individual features that kind of correspond with a poorly rated site versus a well-rated site? Um, what kind of things in the design? What kind of 
content aspects are there that makes this site trustworthy and makes that user think, okay, I'm going to give these people my credit card number, but not these people. Um, and the, there's a whole list of kind of things they get their raters to check through in this document. It's well worth a read. Um, when I talk about AI, AI is a very kind of overhyped thing. I really like this quote on it. AI is just applying the 80-20 rule to systems that can kill people. Um, AI is not that complicated. It's just basic statistics, and they're just kind of working out which things statistically correlate with kind of pages that people engage with. So that user feedback loop is really, really, really important. And again, no user likes just 700 um, words of absolute rubbish shoved at the bottom of a page. Nobody is reading that. This is um, off Google's cloud service. So this is a service that's aimed at developers more than marketers. Um, but it's Google's natural language processing algorithm. And so this is a bit of copy of the um, content for this event from our landing page. And you can see, like, it's figured out on its own. So no kind of pre-training. It's never seen this content before in its life. It says conference sessions. And it's figured out that's an event. So for just from reading the content and understanding that language in the context of what's in there, go and go, OK, this is a conference session. This is an event. What do users typically want to see on an event? Well, they probably want to see like the price, the location, who's talking, um, maybe a map. This is all stuff that from user data they can go, OK, this is stuff that people who engage with pages that are about events tend to like, forms that feedback loop. Again, not just 700 words of keyword-rich copy where you manage to get the word event into every single sentence. Very often in the design stage, people don't think about imagery. Um, you see, see it all the time. You see wireframes, and like, you've just got a big square box with a big X in it. It's just kind of like, picture goes here. And then writers will sit down, and they'll write their words, and they'll go, oh, we need a picture here. Um, let's go into the media library, and oh, that's a pretty picture, and just put it in there. N no other medium would you ever do that. Like If you're doing a storyboard for a TV advert, you wouldn't just sit there and go, glamour shot goes here, and then just film something and stick it in the middle in the edit. You would plan all that out kind of in detail on how to commute all those kind of different assets, the video, the voiceover, the music, and kind of plan all of that to tell your story. The digital we don't do is do that. We just say, let's just stick a picture here, any old picture. Google can see through this as well. Um, so this picture here, I took this, I forget which website I took it off. Um, but I didn't just save it, I screenshotted it. So it's a completely new file, completely new format, no <coughs> metadata. The file name was just picture.jpg. Put it back into Google, and Google figured out it's the Ibis London Docklands. If you're searching for hotels, like, that's quite a visual thing that users are looking for. They're probably looking for a lot of pictures so they can decide, OK, I really, really like this hotel. So is content optimization then sort of sitting there and going, right, what pictures do we want to do that communicate this? Do we want pictures of the outside of a hotel, or do we want lots of like, close-up pictures of bed pillows? Will a picture of a pillow where Google just goes, this is a picture of two pillows, kind of adequately communicate this is a landing page about hotels, is that a content optimization opportunity? Um, just to emphasize the point, so you can get on a Raspberry Pi, so like a 20 pound little mini computer, that can do image recognition. So if that kind of scale of technology can do image recognition, what can Google do at kind of the scale of technology that they have? Um, stock photography, after doing this for nine years, I've slightly fallen in love with smiling call center lady. Um, <laughs> I want to meet her so badly. Um, but like, if you're just using generic stock art that's appearing on a million other websites, we talk in SEO a lot about duplicate content and that Google wants to serve distinct experiences. And if you're just completely copy-pasting somebody else, that's not going to, that you can only have one version of that. Um, that's true of photography as well. If you're using the same photography as a million other websites, Google's just going to go, and you've got the same photography as a million other websites. Users are also going to get sick of seeing the same picture over and over again. And like, they'll start recognizing that pattern and going, oh, this person's cheaped out on their content. I'm, it's a trust signal again. It's, I'm less likely to engage with that. Um, speaking of trust signals, this is stuff that's always been there since the beginning. If you look through um, AdWords kind of guidelines, this has always been there. Um, things like trust badges, um, star ratings, things like um, do you take proper credit cards or do you just have payment by world pay? Shoved at the bottom of your footer. Do you have a privacy policy? Um, like for us as a digital business, there's a reason one of the first things we talked about was kind of who our client list is, because that says, no, we are legitimate, you can trust us, we deal, we're not kind of dealing with kind of 100 pound accounts. Um, trust signals, and that's something that users very commonly look for, and the more user uses the web, the more they start figuring out all those little design patterns that correlate with a good website versus a bad website. As content creators, we've got to reflect that. 
Um, say, just to name and shame Argos again, somebody's searching for cheap sleeping bags. Which one of these two would you say better communicates that value? Or better communicates that we've kind of got what they're looking for? So you've got one on the left with kind of little, little tiny font, or one on the right with the price in big font. I'd say it's that one on the right, right? Somebody's looking for price. That is a better content experience than the one on the left. Um, like, I haven't changed any content in there. That's the exact same content. I've changed one line of CSS just to change the font size. Um, that is a content experience, kind of design, typography, all those things. All tools that in traditional marketing you'd always kind of think of as a holistic, kind of, this is all the kind of elements of creating a marketing asset. But in digital, for some reason, we all kind of think of them in our own kind of little pods, and one person puts together the layout, and another person does the photography, and never the two shall meet. Um, when I showed off this slide kind of in-house, somebody said it was, makes them quite agitated, which I quite liked. Um, just one rule, if your website takes, so there's a study that says every 100 milliseconds your website takes to load, you lose 1% of your engaged audience. If your website takes more than 500 milliseconds to load, and you've got the ability to tell the developer, no, this isn't done, take it back and do this properly, do it, because that website is broken. And every, again, every 100 milliseconds, that is money you're just burning. Um, people don't think like that because development is kind of big, scary thing, and you've got to go through ticketing systems, and things just don't get signed off. So users, I saw one case where a loading wheel was taking about seven seconds to load, and we tagged it with an event to see how many people actually sat through that loading time. They were losing 80% of their audience. So by fixing that, they got 80% of their marketing budget just back. I'd argue this is content. The web is an interactive experience. People have got their hands physically on the mouse or touching their device. This is as much a part of the experience as the words you use or the photography that you use. Um, just a quick one, if you want to quantify how long your take website takes to um, load, I'd use this, webpagetest.org. Um, most of the speed testers uh, tend to be just random number generators. This one's fairly reliable in my experience. I think a key point is one thing that, as a digital marketer, we very often get asked is, SEO my website. <coughs> and it's like, well, why would anybody visit your website over your competition? And an alarming amount of companies don't actually have a good answer for that. I, this is an ex-Google who came up with this quote. Um, SEO does not create value where value does not exist. And I argue this is true of any channel. I, again, I, I view it through an SEO prism. Um, SEO exposes value. And for some to succeed, value must exist. So what is your website's value? And is it your brand? Is it the kind of brand investment that you've built up kind of over years and years of above the line? That's, that's a legitimate value that engage, endears trust. And you can potentially get away with a lot of kind of user experience weaknesses that kind of a smaller brand or somebody hasn't made that investment good. Um, it could be your knowledge. It could be that you're a more useful resource than everybody else. Could be ease of use. It could be you've got a really, really clean user experience. Everybody else is kind of a bit clunky and difficult to use. Um, most big companies, or most kind of really successful companies in the kind of last 10 years, have invested a lot in R&D. And that's why, because they're looking to create value. Airbnb, classic example. Um, Airbnb, weren't a or at least from a customer acquisition standpoint, people like to talk about their business model of not owning any kind of their physical stock that they sell. Um, I mean, that's why they're so profitable. That's why their margins are what their margins are. But that's not the reason from a customer acquisition standpoint. In fact, that probably worked against them in the early days from a customer acquisition standpoint. The reason they were as successful as they were is because they were first to mobile. And that they had a really nice, clean mobile experience at a time when mobile was overtaking desktop. That's why Airbnb took off. That and the fact that they could go global, so you could go anywhere in the world through the same website. Um, other end of the scale, um, this, this is a small client of ours, uh, Hotel Guru. Um, and they're kind of a very small operation who are punching well above their weight because they take the time to invest in their copy. And they decided that's going to be the value that they stand by. So rather than kind of writing generic stuff, they have kind of um, journalists and kind of expert writers creating all of their pages so that they've got added value over, we just farmed it out to a copywriter for 50 quid. So that's my definition of content. Um, it's speed. It's the underlying technology that you work with. It's your database, and I'll get into some examples of that in a little bit. Um, it's your layout, it's your typography, it's your brand, it's your photography. Um, and yeah, it's your copy. You're, I'm not saying that copy is not kind of irrelevant. It's absolutely one of the tools that you can use to reach your audience. But it's not the only one, and very often it gets used as this kind of, fix all, um, kind of solution to fix all problems. Ultimately, if aggregators are all built on a feedback loop, and they all are, 
Um, what's good for users is ultimately good for those aggregators. That if you have a poor user experience, eventually somebody will overtake you. So that's all great, but we need to turn that into some sort of practical advice that you can actually action. Um, and I think as kind of over the next few years, like, there's a lot of discussion out there, and there has been for years now, about like, the death of the industrial advertising complex and that above the line activity is no longer a decent path to purchase. And the, um, kind of the old method of I'm going to capture my audience's attention for 30 seconds in TV and tell them if you don't buy my soap, you're a bad parent. Um, that kind of world is, it's been saying, oh, this is, this is the end of advertising for years. Um, it's, it's happening. It's happening a lot slower than I think most people expected. But what a lot of these traditional brands struggle with is the idea that aggregators exist, people are telling these aggregators in one form or another what they want, and that our job isn't to just to capture their attention and tell an emotional message. Our job is to actually fix that need and to kind of align our brand with helping those people, and that's what success looks like. Um, the fundamental nature of the internet is abundance. There's just so much of it, and users have got their hand physically on a mouse. You don't have their kind of passive attention. Uh, and the critical competency, I think, for any company moving forward is discovery, is being able to be discovered on these platforms. Um, so why in, and this is just some advice for those of you who get, to, I know not all of us get to kind of influence our company's organizational structures, but for those of us who do, why are we structured like this? Uh, why, if I'm sitting there in a company as an SEO and CRO who are doing testing and learning and kind of figuring out how to optimize a user experience, why are we sitting in two different parts of the building and very often never talking? Um, PPC, very often SEO and PPC teams are kept completely apart. We're going after the exact same audience who are doing the exact same things. Um, users don't think like that. Users don't sit there and go, I'm going to engage with quality content through a search engine. <laughs> um, but as companies, we're aligned to kind of think of the internet like that. I think that's a little bit crazy. So what you end up with is this. You end up with oh, I think we're not communicating price effectively on our landing page. So I've got to go to a head of digital, who's then got to go to another head, who's then got to get it into a dev queue, who's then got to go through a UX sign-off and blah, 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 blah. If it's just a theory, if you're just sitting there going, oh, I think this could be what we need to test and learn from, there's no way you're going to kind of, because that's, you get this wrong, you just cost your company a few hundred grand and you get fired. So nobody's going to take that chance. So I think that's how organizational structures are aligned against, kind of, are very often aligned against companies being successful. I think, as an SEO, my job's increasingly looking like this. There's increasing amount of crossover with UX specialists, with CROs, design and development, and with information architects. Um, I think there's different specialists in what is kind of the same sort of discipline. I think kind of just the broad kind of idea of own media as a holistic thing is a way, kind of own media and maybe paid media is maybe how companies need to be more structured. The other thing working against is technology. Um, how many people in here can code, out of curiosity? So, two, three? Um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, very few people can just um, can do this. And developers will sit there and go, well, if you want to change it, do it yourself. I learned how to code, why can't you? And it's like, well, you don't understand how to do marketing, right? We've all got our skill sets. I think when we're in design and development, we need to be make kind of understanding that we need platforms that we can change and alter and evolve over time. Um, so I think during the development process, we need to start insisting on modularity and insisting on flexibility within our platforms that developers enable us to be able to make the changes that we need. Uh, I think that's something that kind of whenever a new project is being developed, we need to fight for. Technology debt is a big problem. I am going to name and shame Sitecore because I hate them and they're terrible. <laughs> um, it tends to be, and it's not just Sitecore, it tends to be, especially at the enterprise end of kind of platforms, they tend to be very inflexible. Also, kind of a lot of brands that have been around for a while have kind of technology that's 20 years old. It's just stuff piled on top of stuff. It makes it very difficult for them to affect any sort of changes in their user experience. Again, that's how you get disrupted. I'd argue paying off your technology debt it doesn't feel like a cost with an immediate return on investment because it doesn't necessarily change anything. Um, but if you're kind of constantly running into, I need to change this, oh, sorry, our platform doesn't support that, well, we start making, making the platform support that. A good way to do this, I think, is user stories. So this is something a lot of developers have started doing. Um, so sort of sit there and go, right, I'm developing a website, and what do I want, what do I think all my users are going to need to be able to do? And then they can go away and segment that into different bits of code and kind of write that code and test it. And, and that's kind of how increasingly how software is coming together. 
Uh, I think this is actually a very, very powerful tool, and I think that's something that we can, as marketers, adopt. Um, I'm increasingly thinking, like, when we do a keyword research piece, maybe the output of that isn't, here's 50,000 keywords. It's, right, I've analyzed these, and this is what all the different stories that I think a user is going to have to be able to do. Right, here you go, development team. Make sure the website has the capability to potentially support all of this. Whether that's in something like your database, making sure that information is there in the database, ready to be exposed. And then that can be turned into something like a navigation element. So again, using keyword data, figuring out what your users want, make sure that's in a user story, and then the, that can be developed into whatever the right user experience for your um, kind of audience is. We have a process, and it really needs a new name, um, called the user needs matrix. Um, it's basically that. It's basically doing keyword volume at, or keyword analysis at scale. Because the problem is you still get keyword data from Google. You don't get kind of this is all the needs and intents from Google. Um, basically, it's just basic machine learning and using machine learning to categorize keywords and aggregate those together. So for anybody who's involved in kind of channel level execution, I very highly recommend working through this. It's a, it takes about half a day. It's a tutorial for AWS's, so Amazon's machine learning platform. I like Amazon's because it's all graphical interface based. You don't need to be a developer to use it. It's pretty straightforward. Like if you can use Excel, you can, you can use this. Um, and like once you work your way through a tutorial and creating an um, artificial intelligence model, like it's hugely powerful. And I like mean, your brain will just immediately go in 15 different directions at once. Of course, people don't always declare their needs coming in. You get a generic term. So I, I want a holiday. I want a holiday in Tenerife. But you don't know what that's going to make that user buy. Google does, so Google can see what questions somebody who searches a generic term goes on to ask before and after. Uh, there's some tools out there that you can use to sort of start picking away at that data. So this is onto the public, which a fair few of you have seen before. Um, that just goes to Google Suggest and says, okay, what questions are people asking about this keyword? Uh, you can also pull out the searches related to a term. Um, you can also use NLP. So one thing we've started doing as a bit of R&D is using the same platform saying, OK, who's in the top 10 for any given term? Right, what concepts are on all their landing pages? Using this to pull all that out and kind of discover trends, um, and then sit there and go, OK, so people are searching this. They tend to like content that's about this topic, this topic. It's got this, this, this feature on it. Good way that you can do kind of research at scale. So you can take that 100,000 keyword list and then aggregate that down into common themes that you can then turn into user stories. Uh, just one final thing we do we use it for quite a bit is projections, um, specifically this bit on the left here. So, so you don't want loads and loads of keywords that are just meaningless. You want to be able to figure out what the intent are behind them are. If anyone's ever done manual classification of keywords, um, I could do about 1,000 a day when I was an exec, and then by day number four, I'd be drinking heavily. Um, what the, but you, need, you kind of need this data, because if you just say, here's a list of 100,000 keywords, you can't really turn that into strategy. Or if you do turn that into strategy, the strategy ends up being, OK, well, I'm going to get a link with this anchor text, or I'm going to just stuff this keyword in five times. We need to, again, be thinking about user needs. And by aggregating keywords into common themes, that's how you profile what those needs are. Um, most keyword research pieces, we do this anyway. Uh, this is kind of projection. So we've, especially when we're kind of in a pre-sale situation, we've sort of figured out, OK, where can we take you for each of these keywords and say, OK, Add those together, that's your return on investment. And you get a graph that looks a little bit like this. Um, very often when you come from the top down, this is actually quite accurate. The problem with it is there's no way as when you're executing a strategy to go from that to individual actions that we're going to take because you go straight into very granular keyword data. And that's where aggregation comes in. Again, AI can be a very powerful tool. Like you can train 20% of your, or you can manually classify 20% of your keywords and then let AI do the other 80%. Saves, you a whole, saves your liver a whole lot of damage. Uh, and then once you've aggregated it, you can start thinking beyond keywords. So you can start saying, right, we've got a massive gap on our website in communicating about price. What changes can we make to our template? Or what design cues can we add that are going to better service that need? Or we're nowhere on reviews. Why? Well, our reviews are eight levels deep in our site. OK, how can we bring those kind of more in line to the user experience, into the pages that users are actually seeing? Whatever those assets are. And that's how you affect real change or kind of real significant change beyond kind of just writing article after article is figuring out kind of the user experience at every stage of your website. So I've just thrown a hell of a lot at you. Um, key messages, I think, just aggregators are based on user data. We don't have SEO content. 
Um, use the right tool for the right job, and copy absolutely is sometimes the right tool for the right job, but it's not the only tool that we have in our toolbox. Um, users don't think in channels, neither should we. Um, nobody cares about your platform limitations. That's on us, uh, kind of us in our organizations to fix. And NLP, AI, all these kind of modern things that Google talk about, that's not just for a Google or a Microsoft or an Apple or an Amazon. These are tools that we can use in our day to day. And it's at a state where it's packaged up, that it's actually very accessible for an artist like us to access and use. Um, just to finish on a bit of a poll. So question is, what would you say is your biggest content marketing challenge? Um, I think it's a slider. 